As a busy 4 h -er, you probably have many outfits to choose from when you get dressed each day. Have you ever wondered what your parents wore when they were your age? Or perhaps their parents? If your grandparents were teens in the 1930s, they might have chosen a dressy outfit like this for an awards ceremony. Now imagine their parents and grandparents. Notice the dressy clothes the youths in this picture are wearing. Would you like to wear suits and dresses like these? Now think about this teen from an even earlier generation. Can you see yourself in an outfit like this? Early Iowans who lived here in the 1840s among the Native Americans might have dressed like this. A pioneer family similar to this may have been your great-great-grandparents. In this presentation, you'll learn more about, first, clothes of the past, second, appropriate clothing for various activities, and third, fashion and fabric terms you can use as you consider clothing choices and start preparing for a career in the fashion industry. This videotape is divided into six parts. Part one concerns everyday clothes for school and work. Part two is about clothes for warmth and comfort. Part three focuses on clothes for sports and play. Part four features dressy clothes. Part five shows special occasion clothes and uniforms. And part six accents underclothes and accessories. After each segment, you can stop the tape and discuss the clothing items you saw. Ask questions. If you can't find answers immediately, list your questions so you can find an answer later. Pioneers came to Iowa 150 years ago, between the 1840s and 1870s. They came seeking a better life to farm and raise families. Their children had fewer clothes to choose from and the clothes they had were different from yours. At that time, infant and preschool boys and girls both wore dresses until they were five or six years old. And Iowa pioneers did not believe that girls should wear pink and boys blue. So this pink top, called a tunic, and its lace-edged pantaloons might have been worn by a baby boy or baby girl during the 1880s. A one-year-old toddler who could sit or crawl might have worn a tunic with pants to cover the diaper. This tunic is from the 1880s. This blue and white cotton polka dot dress from the early 1900s looks as if it was worn a lot. It would have been cool for summer. High waists were common, but the small buttons would have been difficult for a young child to fasten. This little boy's eyelet trimmed petticoat shows under his dress in this 1915 picture. Notice how the cotton fabric wrinkles. If we leap ahead to the 1940s, we can see the children in this school photo were wearing more practical clothes. Boys wore denim or heavy cotton overalls, and girls wore high-waisted cotton dresses that were shorter than knee length. They wore anklet socks and sturdy leather shoes. Catalogs and fashion magazines delivered by mail made it easier for rural teenage girls to make fashionable choices for school. This dropped waist plaid dress from the 1940s features a bias cut front panel. What we wear says something about how we live. In the 1950s, many clothes were still home sewn, like this blue cotton dress with its handmade buttonholes. Although many families had more money for clothes, mothers still had time at home to sew. In the 1950s, people believed that science and technology could solve the world's problems. People liked anything new. Printing on jersey knit was new, but the style of this loose dress doesn't need to be a stretchy knit. This shirtwaist style dress with Peter Pan collar and a shiny plastic belt was fashionable in 1952. The fabric texture was created with heat. Nylon is thermoplastic, which means it softens and shrinks in high heat. Pressing with a hot roller shrinks some yarns, and the rest crinkle up to form a waffle surface. In 1958, denim overalls might have been worn over knit long underwear in winter. Overalls were considered work clothes. In the 1990s, women wore them as a casual fashion item. Denim twill was first made in Nîmes, France, hence it was called Serge de Nîmes, and later simply denim. Many young farmers wore overalls for work, but as you can see, overalls sometimes were worn to public events. 
Do you think these 4-H'ers were in Share the Fun wearing a white shirt and tie with their overalls? By the 1960s, polymer chemistry led to the development of many manufactured fibers. Acrylics, as in this striped sweater, were made to imitate wool. They did not shrink in the washer and dryer. However, some acrylics stretched and fuzz balls, called pills, formed on the surface during wear and washing. This 4-H'er wore denim jeans and a hat with a brim to show his calf at a county fair in 1965. Durable denim has stayed popular since the 1870s when Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis patented pants with riveted pockets for the miners and cowboys in San Francisco. Before that, denim was used as sails for sailing ships and covers for covered wagons. Outerwear clothes are warmer if they have a tightly woven outer layer to protect from wind and rain and a thick inner layer to insulate by holding still air close to the body. Sometimes clothing can look warm but not offer much protection. Look for the features that make these historic clothes comfortable. The front of this dress is quilted thick with many layers to make it warmer. Can you guess when this dress and cape were worn? We believe it was made for a baby about 1874. Short sleeves were a sign of babyhood. The long sleeves were probably added to the dress later, when the baby was older. The cape gave added protection for outdoors. Cold weather ear protection seems guaranteed with this hat, and it's important to keep your ears warm. The wool coat would be warm enough, but the light stockings would not be much protection for this girl. This boy's snowsuit was made out of an adult's old coat in 1932. During the depression of the 1930s, families stretched their budgets by recycling the less worn parts of older adult clothing to make new clothes for children. This allowed children to have warm clothes even if the family could not afford to buy them. By the 1950s, most Iowa families could afford to buy ready to wear for their children. Your own grandparents might have worn a snowsuit similar to this one when they were toddlers. We all know Iowa is hot in the summer. These children are dressed to stay cool. During the 1940s, girls' summer dresses had short puffed sleeves. Other features that helped kids stay cool were light colors and cotton fabric. Sport and play clothes have become increasingly specialized in recent years. You may have special bicycle shorts and helmet, a rollerblade outfit with knee and elbow pads, a bowling shirt, or dance slippers. 150 years ago, only rich people could afford such luxuries, but now many people have them. You can see from the stains on this child's dress that it was worn for active play. The long-waisted style may have been worn as early as 1900 or as late as 1920. Cotton rompers were designed so that children could move freely to run, jump, and play. Both boys and girls wore rompers in the 1910s and 20s. Notice that this pair has buttons to make diapering easier. At the time of this photo in 1901, most families would not allow their daughters to wear pants. Knickers were considered improper for girls, so perhaps the girls in this old picture were dressed up for a costume party. Teenage girls did not play many team sports before the 1930s, though they did do gymnastics, skating, cycling, swimming, and dancing. Teenage girls began to wear pants in the 1920s. This picture shows a 1920s or 30s denim midi blouse and tan-colored knickers. During the 1920s, there was greater interest in sports and clubs where these clothes were appropriate. By 1910, children were expected to go to school rather than work and learn at home. This sailor suit was a popular style for well-to-do boys' play clothes. What do you think would happen to this white cotton suit if you wore it outdoors to play? Sailor outfits were popular for girls, too. They could be worn to school, which was now mandatory for all until age 16. Both rich and poor had a chance for an education. 
Manufactured fibers such as nylon, acrylic, rayon, and polyester were being used in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Sporty clothes like these in bright, strong colors were very popular. With manufactured fibers, durable, less expensive clothes could be made. New dyes and printing methods also provided greater choice. When you see antique photos or old family pictures, the people are usually dressed up. It's natural to want to look your best when your picture is taken. Because of this, we have more examples of people showing dressy clothes than everyday clothes. Dressy clothes tend to be more fashionable and complex than the clothes we wear every day. This wool and linen dress for a three or four year old dates from the 1840s. Most children's clothes closed in the back and were made of less expensive fabrics than those their parents wore. If your parents were rich, you might have a multicolored print dress like this when you were three or four years old. When this dress was worn in the 1820s to 1840s, fabrics printed with this many colors were new and would have been imported from England. Only rich families could afford clothes like this. Pioneers sometimes used trim to make clothes look more dressy. Braid, as shown in this wool dress, was sewn in curved patterns and called soutache trim. Today, we often see trim like this on band uniforms. This dress from the 1870s might have been wearable for more than one year because it had no defined waistline seam for a child to outgrow. This short dress from the 1880s was for a preteen. It would be worn over another dress, which could either be white or colored. This sort of machine embroidered cotton lace was very popular during the 1880s when machines first started to produce it. Dressy clothes for teenage girls in the 1880s were a lot like the ones their mothers wore. The top of this silk dress was fitted, but probably not as tight as the bodice of a woman's dress. Wearing clothes that fasten in the back was a sign that you were still a child who needed help to get dressed. Clothes for older children fastened in the front, so the preteen girl who wore this dress in the 1880s was independent enough to dress herself. Girls often wore fine white cotton dresses for visiting friends, going to parties, school events, town, or church in the 1890s. Few towns had paved roads, and to get there, your family would hitch up the horses and ride in a carriage or wagon. How would you like to travel that way and try to keep a dress like this looking tidy? Boys' dressy clothes in the 1890s included short pants with white shirts, fancy collars, and neckties or bows. Can you picture making a Sunday visit to your grandparents wearing this? The other type of dressy clothes boys wore was the suit. This suit from 1898 includes a wool jacket and short pants and a cotton vest and hat. It has a naval theme, which was common in suits for school-age boys. Short pants were traded for long pants as the young man got older. Most Iowa children lived and worked on the farm. Their horses took them to dressy occasions, such as fairs or church. In 1901, this teen's wool suit had a cutaway coat. This suit belonged to a younger boy in 1910. The short pants have buttons at the waist and would be buttoned to suspenders. The shorts and cap are made out of velvet. The vest and jacket are wool tweed. This dress and jacket made of silk is for a little girl, about three to seven years old. It was worn around 1918. It is a high waist and knee length skirt. By 1930, some children's clothes were designed so children could dress themselves. When children were successful in dressing without help, they enjoyed feelings of independence and achievement. Do you think this boy had help with his long stockings? In the 1930s, when mothers made clothes for their children, they often tried to make something unavailable in stores. Smocking and hand-embroidered flowers on the collar make this cotton dress special. Embroidery made this taffeta dress look fancier and added a touch of individuality. Frilly dresses, embroidery, and short puffy sleeves were thought to make little girls to look more dainty and sweet. 
Being a teenager is sometimes awkward. Clothes for teenage girls from the 1920s to 1930s look sort of like kids' clothes and sort of like adults. This girl is wearing ringlets like her little sisters might have worn for photos, but her dress is long-waisted and fitted like her mom's might be. Special occasions are often events which celebrate beginnings, achievements, and endings. Special occasion clothes are the ones we reserve for special events where everyday or school clothes would not be dressing enough. Few occasions were more special than a wedding. This bodice and skirt was made around 1875 for a young woman's wedding. We believe that she made it herself. Most women were married in their parents' house and made a new dress for the wedding that they could wear again afterward. In early Iowa history, girls and boys became adults when they got married and started a family of their own. They married at an earlier age than young people do now. This photo shows two young people at their wedding in 1901. The first time a child needed a special occasion outfit might be for a christening or naming ceremony. This christening dress was worn in 1828. Christening dresses were usually much longer than the baby. Even infants' clothes are affected by fashion. This dress from the 1880s has princess-lined seams, like some of the tunics we saw earlier. One thing often seen in pioneer children's clothing is rows of tucks like the ones in this 1900s baby dress. Tucks could be merely decorative or used to make clothes longer. Junior senior prom was an important occasion for teens in the 1950s. Nylon net and or tulle fabrics were a technological innovation, and nylon net prom dresses were very popular. Although they looked soft and filmy, the net fabric felt harsh and stiff. The dresses were underlined with acetate taffeta for comfort next to the skin and so you couldn't see through. The strapless long prom dress also was a favorite in the late 1950s. The bodice was held up with boning and the skirt was held out with hoops. These dresses required tight elastic strapless bras and hoop petticoats. Ask your grandparents if they remember these. Uniforms are clothes that everyone in a group wears to show group membership. They may be only a part of your whole outfit. In this 1940s grade school band, the uniform hat and cape were worn over their regular clothes. Students at military schools usually wear uniforms. This wool uniform has a tailored military style jacket and pants with a stripe down the leg. About 1920, these belonged to a boy in his early teens. In the not too distant past, 4-H'ers had uniforms that were usually green and white. This photo shows 4-H'ers in their uniforms. Scout uniforms are seldom exactly the same. As scouts study more topics, they earn badges that are sewn on the uniform. Scouts know the meaning of the badges. This Girl Scout uniform was for a teenage girl in the 1930s. Boy Scout uniforms are brown, not green. Clothes and accessories help define a clothing outfit. Accessory fashions and functions change with the times, but basic needs for warmth, comfort, pleasing design, and individual expression are as important today as in the past. This straw and satin bonnet was worn by a 5 to 12 year old girl from an Iowa pioneer family. It has ties so that it will not blow away in the wind. The wide brim, which is made of straw, kept the sun off the girl's face. In this photo from 1900, the boys are wearing berets. A beret is a French-style hat made of soft, fulled wool. Some soldiers wear this style hat. Have you ever heard of the green berets? Hats can not only create an image, they can help keep your head warm. A pioneer girl was laced tight into a corset to form her body into a perfect hourglass figure. 
This corset from the 1830s to 50s has layers of fabric stitched together, but it lacks the metal, reed, or whalebone rods used in women's corsets. These training corsets were for teens or preteens. Today, as you change and grow, you can opt for looser clothes or spandex for more comfortable body shaping. Suspenders like these made sure a young man's pants stayed up. They were worn over the shoulders. Today, we use elastic for the straps and clips to attach the pants. Instead of clips, these suspenders have buttonholes, which would attach to buttons on the pants. Because young people were allowed to wear shorter trousers or skirts, their socks and stockings had to be longer to conceal the legs and keep them warm. Garters attached to the stockings below the hip and above the knee. Cotton or wool stockings might be knitted to shape with a seam up the back. If you look closely at this picture, you can see part of the boys' garters. Both boys and girls wore garters. Today, our socks have ribbing at the top with elastic threads knitted in to help them stay up. How would you like to wear garters? In 1909, the high button leather shoe was popular for preteen boys and girls. The tool used to button shoes was called a button hook. Around 1900, young people wore comfortable athletic shoes only when they played sports. Most of the time, teens wore fashionable shoes with pointed toes like adult shoes. Boots like these needed to be polished every few days. Pinafores were very simple dresses that buttoned or tied in the back and were worn over other dresses to keep them clean during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Some had no sleeves and some had ruffles over the shoulder. Most pinafores look like plain white dresses. Is this a pinafore or a dress? It has short sleeves and some trim, so it would be worn on the outside but it could be worn over another dress to keep it clean. Many girls wore pinafores to school, as well as when helping around the home. Another way to stay clean was to wear an apron, like this one from 1960 to 1970. Aprons could be fancier than pinafores and might just cover the skirt or have a bib to cover the blouse. A fad for non-woven paper dresses like this occurred in the 1960s, but the dresses tore too easily. Futurists at the time thought everyone would wear disposable clothing by now because it was inexpensive, innovative, and could be printed in bright colors. Although you don't see much disposable paper clothing on the street today, it is widely used for hospital examining room gowns and other special applications. The way we dress changes as we get older, and it changes as our community changes. What we choose to wear says something about us as well as the world we live in. The girls in this 1930s 4-H fashion show model the clothes they made. These styles were fashionable at the time, but today you can only see them if you take a look in the attic closet. <laughs>